for joining us on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Angel Ito. Brandis Friedman has the evening off. On the show tonight, a push to expand protections for homeowners in South Shore amid gentrification concerns sparked by the Obama Presidential Center. Everyone deserves quality health care. A new state advisory council looks to increase access to sickle cell disease treatment, what this could mean for patients. And a new book celebrates Black Chicago's influence. And now to some of today's top stories. The Illinois Supreme Court is agreeing to hear Jesse Smollett's appeal. Now it comes more than two years after the former Empire star was convicted of orchestrating an elaborate hate crime hoax against himself. Smollett was sentenced to serve 150 days of his 30-month probation sentence in jail, but that sentence has since been put on hold during his excessive, extensive appeal. Now, Smollett's attorneys argued double jeopardy should have been applied when a special prosecutor filed renewed charges against him after Cook County Jail dropped their initial case. Now, former Governor Pat Quinn wants voters to weigh in on whether to use public funds for a new Bears or White Sox stadium. Quinn is pushing for a referendum to be put on the ballot in November's election that would ask Chicago voters whether state or local taxpayer money should be spent to build a new stadium or real estate development. Quinn filed the petition today at the city clerk's office. I think the people of Chicago are sports fans, big time sports fans, but we're also fans of the taxpayer. We've got to make sure that everyday people who are living from paycheck to paycheck get a fair shake. And the Shedd Aquarium's newest sea otter officially has a name. Meet Saldovia, who was rescued last October from Alaska. Now, the Shedd Aquarium says onlookers called the Alaska Sea Life Center to rescue the pup after noticing it was in distress. The sea otter's name comes from the Saldovia Village tribe in Alaska, who participated in the pup's rescue. Shedd Aquarium says Saldovia is interactive and cooperative with his caretakers and has begun meeting the other rescue rescued otters at the aquarium. And up next, gentrification concerns in South Shore. Heather Sharon joins us with more right after this. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. There's a renewed push to expand protections for long-term homeowners in South Shore from gentrification. Now, it comes as construction on the Obama Presidential Center continues in Jackson Park. Advocates are hoping the passage of a non-binding ballot question will breathe new life into their years-long fight. Reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. All right, so Heather, walk me through it. Nearly 80 percent of voters in two precincts of the 7th Ward endorsed an advisory referendum on the primary ballot that was aimed at all Alderman Greg Mitchell and Mayor Brandon Johnson. What exactly did voters support? So this measure was crafted by a coalition of groups who have long been concerned that South Shore and Woodlawn is now ground zero for Chicago's affordable housing crisis. And they're hoping the results of this advisory referendum will convince Alderman Mitchell and Mayor Johnson to put the full force behind a proposal from Alderman Desmond Yancey of the Fifth War that would expand protections now in place in Woodlawn to those living in South Shore. This proposal was introduced nearly six months ago. It's stalled in the city council. So I understand that the Fifth Ward Alderman Yancey said that the results are more evidence that additional protections are needed for long-term residents in South Shore. What's next in the fight over gentrification in that neighborhood? So this proposal would essentially make it easier for the city to build affordable housing on land the city owns near the Obama Presidential Center. And it would also set aside millions of dollars to 
help longtime homeowners stay in their homes with grants for repairs and relief for property taxes because we all know when you've got sort of a gentrifying area, the value of those properties can skyrocket, which means that longtime homeowners may be hit with massive property tax increases. Mm, but any progress has been complicated by the tense relationship between Alderman Yancey and Alderman Mitchell, who both share South Shore. So where do they stand now after last month's confrontation? So after the February 15th City Council meeting, Alderman Yancey said Alderman Mitchell attacked him. Now, Alderman Mitchell says that he didn't do that, he wouldn't do that, but it's clear that these two older people who share a neighborhood disagree on whether this is the right way to go. And because of the City Council's long tradition of aldermanic prerogative, it would be very unlikely for the City Council to adopt something like this for a ward where the local older person didn't need it. So that's why this advisory referendum was put on the ballot to sort of increase pressure on Alderman Mitchell and on Mayor Johnson, who campaigned on this issue, but hasn't really thrown the full force of his office behind it. All right, lots going on in South Shore, and you can read Heather's full story on our website. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. Sickle cell disease affects about 5,000 people across Illinois, and it's mostly impacting black communities. Now, the inherited disease occurs when healthy red blood cells become sickle-shaped and stiff, which can lead to anemia and other health problems. And while gene therapies have emerged to treat the disease, the high costs can limit their access. But a new state advisory council is looking to address this by examining how Illinois' Medicaid program can help cover expenses. Fairness demands that as progress is made, we do everything in our power to make those treatments and cures accessible to everyone. We'll be working with the federal government, which has a similar effort through CMS to solve for these challenges. My goal is to make emerging and transformative gene and cell therapy treatments affordable and available for all Illinoisans who need them. Joining us now with more are Ronisha edwards Elliott, an advocacy worker with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Illinois and is also a sickle cell patient, and Dr. Robert Maloki from the UI Health Division of Hematology and Oncology, who special specializes in the treatment of sickle cell disease. Thank you both so much for joining us. Ronisha, let's start with you. Now, we just heard Governor Pritzker and his goals that he has for the council. Um, what are sickle cell disease advocates hoping to see from this and how do they hope to be involved? Yes, great question. I believe that sickle cell patients really felt like this was a major win for our community, knowing the disparities that we face as patients. And so I believe that this advisory committee is beginning steps to, for much needed equity in sickle cell disease. So we are looking forward to being a part of this committee. We hope that this committee involves stakeholders like ourselves who have really been advocating for a very long time for this disease. We've done a lot of things such as lobbying. We've done a lot of things such such as raising awareness about the disparities that exist in the sickle cell disease. And we would love to contribute to access to care and understanding how costs and feasibility are major things for this disease. What impact do you see this having on those that are living with the disease? I believe that people living with this disease will now feel like their voices are being heard. Sometimes sickle cell disease make you feel silent and invisible because of the many complications and because of the, the amount of people that it affects. 100,000 doesn't seem like many, but when we look at the race, the race, the ethnicity of those who are impacted, there are many of us who are living in this, in this struggle. And so for the community, it feels like our voices will finally be elevated and people will understand what we are experiencing. Now, Dr. Maloki, we mentioned a little bit of how sickle cell disease changes the structure of red blood cells, but can you explain the greater impacts that it has on someone's yeah. health? Um, so it's interesting that in our DNA, we have these things called nucleotide pairs, and there's three billion of them in each cell. 
there's a change in only one out of three billion that actually causes sickle cell disease. And so what happens, it was originally, it's thought that it developed in order to help protect you from dying from malaria, which is still a really common disease in the world, though not very common in the United States. And so what happens is when the hemoglobin, which is this molecule within red blood cells, loses, delivers oxygen to the cells, it allows the hemoglobin to form these long chains. And when it starts forming these long chains, it starts damaging the inside of the cell. It makes these long chains that cause a shape change, so it looks like a sickle. And then it also bursts open these cells. So we, we make two million red cells a second. There's 250 million of these molecules in them. And we evolved to have the nice, normal red cell there. And when all these things come flying out, they cause just catastrophic uh, events to people. Yeah. So there's no organ that in some manner isn't affected. In the United States and in developed economies, it's actually pretty good, although with best care right now that we know, people have at least a 20-year decrease in ex life expectancy compared to people without the disease. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, 50% of people with sickle cell disease die before they're five. Wow. So this is a huge impactful disease. And even um, someone may look like they're doing well, mm -hmm. but in 10 minutes, if this air conditioning gets too cold in here, she can end up in the emergency room with a severe pain episode. There's tons of other complications that go on, stress. Pain is the most common um, side effect of the disease and the pain can be excruciating. People will have had natural childbirth, feel that the pain from bad pain episodes is worse than that. Oh my <clears throat> There's issues that will occur, say in the United States, um, for patients, the majority of people in the United States who have sickle cell disease are of African background. In the world, the country with the most number of people is India, it hits the northern Mediterranean, and frequently require high doses of opioids in order to control the pain, go in an emergency room, wait endless hours, wait more hours than whites who will have the same problem, low amounts of um, pain medicines that they get. And so there's this, and that stress, stresses out the patient. Yeah, um, I want to ask Renisha, tell us a little bit about like what your experience is like living with the disease. You just kind of mentioned some of that yes. general experience, but tell us about yours. And all of that is very true. Um, I've been fortunate enough to find power in all of that, but sickle cell disease is something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Um, I don't know a day without pain since, since the age of 11. And oftentimes, sometimes the sickle cell patients, we categorize ourselves as, and people say it's an invisible complication because you can't see what's going in, on, on inside of my body by just looking at me. And oftentimes it takes someone to really believe what we are experiencing to really support and help us. But primarily what I've, I've experienced, I've experienced every inequity that a person with sickle cell disease usually encounters, which includes long wait times, not having the appropriate medication that I need because opioid treatment is the main treatment. Understanding that right now there are four FDA approved medications for this disease and oftentimes we go through battles of insurance coverage and literally just really not feeling normal as a person, feeling like I have to choose between my wellness and who I want to be. Those are just a little of some of the things that I've experienced as a patient. Now, Dr. Maluki, can you explain the gene therapies now the, and the impact that they're having? So there's a few different types of gene therapies. There's, there's one called a, a, a classic one where if you have a relative, a sibling, mm -hmm. um, and they can do some tests to see if it would be a thing called a match. Um, it turns out there's probably only around 10, 20 percent of people with sickle cell disease have that because your siblings have a 25 percent chance of having sickle cell disease depending upon the genetics of the parents. So they're also at high risk of having the disease. And so now there's new therapies, and this is the gene therapies that are coming about. So one of the things is potentially interesting is that newborns with sickle cell disease don't appear to have too many problems. And that's because there's a different hemoglobin, this oxygen carrying protein that fetuses have. And in the first few months of life, that stops being made and then the hemoglobin that causes sickle cell disease really starts increasing. It turns out that a lot of the people in India actually have another mutation where they don't turn that gene off. So they have enough of something else in the red cell so that when the sickle hemoglobin loses its oxygen, the chances of these two molecules hitting decreases. So the patients do really pretty well. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of therapies. There's some drugs that were actually started at U of I to try to increase fetal hemoglobin. But now there's this new gene therapies. And the two of the ones that, the one that is approved actually increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin in each cell. 
So it decreases the cells breaking all up in this polymerization. And we believe that really is sort of the primary point that causes every, you know, uh, every organ again being dis dysfunctional. So we're running out of time here, but Renisha, I just want to ask you one follow-up question. You've kind of talked about what your experience has been like of living with the disease, but what advice would you give to others that are, that are fighting? Keep fighting that your life is worth it and that there are advocates out here that when you do feel silence and you do, feel, you do not feel like your voice has power, we believe that it does have power, and we're going to make sure that this society hears us and understand the needs of the community, and this this executive order that was signed by Governor Pritzker is just the start of what is on the horizon for sickle cell patients. Well, thank you both so much. Up next, a look at black, how black Chicago has influenced culture. Often overlooked in mainstream media, a new book explores black Chicago's influence on pop culture and the world. Now, the book is called We Are the Culture, Black Chicago's Influence on Everything. And joining us now is the author, Ariane Nettles. Ariane, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Angel. Yes. So let's get right into it. I know that this book was several, several years in yeah. the making. How did the conceptual, the, the concept of the book come about? Well, I definitely wanted to do something that was paying homage to Chicago, right? And um, being in Chicago and loving this place so much, I recognize that, especially here in Chicago, um, how we are viewed sometimes with the rest of the country, with the rest of the world, is not um, as influential as we really are. And so um, then being a black Chicagoan, I wanted to make sure that I kind of brought that home and I brought in a lot of the culture that I grew up in, that I am still learning about, a lot of that history, and really being able to kind of just show pride in what we have here in Chicago and how it has spread everywhere. So what did you learn about your city while researching for this book? I know one of the things that we had talked about was Soul Train, right? But was there any other Chicago histories or tidbits that you were like, wow, I had no idea? Yeah, there were so many. And I think there was a lot of things that I had a little inkling about, but that I just had no idea just how influential it was. So, mm -hmm. for example, like with hair care, I knew, you know, from growing up that we had a pretty strong black hair care industry, um, you know, but I didn't realize that we had so many influential families that created these brands and I didn't realize how their um, influence then extended into, for example, entertainment, right? Like um, we talked, you just mentioned Soul Train. Would Soul Train have been able to remain as popular um, and been able to grow if it hadn't have been for, for example, black hair care companies that put money into that advertising when maybe other people wouldn't. So it's all so integrated and I just really, you know, I'm, I'm still learning more and more. Every single day I learn more about how beautiful this place is and it just made me want to like keep going and learn more. And of course, you know, as a reporter, mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of it had been what I had already been reporting on. And so just kind of sitting down and formalizing it and spreading it out. I just learned so much more, though. And so when I was reading this, I, we're, 
we're learning so much, right, about you and your family alongside of the Chicago history, but you say that this isn't a memoir. It's not a memoir. So tell me, what genre do you think it is? I mean, I guess at first I thought that I would put it into history, but I think that you're right, that, you know, I do have essays in there, um, and the point of those essays are not to show any type of exceptionalism or specialness. It's really to show, like, hey, I experienced this really cool thing. This is my connection to this subject matter. This is my family's connection. And I bet you that if you are a black Chicagoan, you have some type of connection to this same thing. So it was really to try to, like, connect us and to talk about these connected experiences. Um, so I guess I could say, like, part essay, part history, um, but I didn't want it to necessarily be a memoir about me. I only chose stories that were relatable, stories that I thought talked about the experience that we can all, you know, relate most of to. us can relate to, mm -hmm. yeah. And another thing that your book highlights is several, like, influential media makers that started in Chicago, including the Chicago Defender, who created the infamous yeah. Southside Bud Billiken Parade. We also have the Johnson Publishing Company and even Oprah Winfrey, who got her start here. Mm -hmm. So how would you say that these outlets that you've highlighted have influenced uh, mainstream media today? Yeah, I think that really how we interact with a lot of media um, can be seen in the starts of some of those things, right? When you talk about The Defender, um, how influential it was, and even just, you know, its op-eds, you know, how to have, like, a really strong perspective um, in a way that we might see now mm -hmm. in certain pieces. Um, when we talk about Ebony and Jet, lifestyle, right? Showing br black lifestyle on the pages in glossy magazines, right? Making it look appealing and beautiful and something that you want to aspire to. Like, that's what we still try to do today. And mm -hmm. so it's just really influential. And I noticed another thing that you had while I was reading uh -huh. that you pay tribute to different music genres yeah. that originated here. So blues, jazz, why did you decide to yeah. do that? Well, one thing was that I realized that I could write a whole book just about the music, right? Um, and so I had to make a lot of tough decisions and I couldn't include a lot. And so wherever I could, I realized how can I integrate music back into this? And I think because music really is the soundtrack of all these things that we do. If you're talking, you know, about um, Ebony and Jet, for example, who were these amazing musicians that came through? So all of these things, they all just tie together so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And continuing with music, another yeah. tidbit that you have in your book is kind of a playlist, if you mm -hmm. will, right? Whether it be starting at the beginning of a different section of the yeah. book or a chapter, you've outlined different um, artists that you were listening to. So some of those include How I Got Over by Mahalia Jackson, mm -hmm. Go by Common, and I'm Ready by Muddy Waters. Why did you decide to incorporate a playlist? Yeah, well, one way is that it was... Um, a way for me to try to dive into some of the genres that I couldn't, you know, get into in depth. So, for example, you know, I don't have maybe specifically a chapter on gospel, but Chicago gospel was so influential, is so influential, right? Mm -hmm. And so making sure that, like, that influence is spread throughout. I wanted every piece of this book to be a different way to be to, touched by Chicago yeah. by any song yes wow it's so great and so again the book is called we are the culture black Chicago's influence on everything and it's set to be released on April 16th we have those details and that full playlist on our website and that's our show for tonight. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com slash news for the very latest from WTTW News. And join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 10 for Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. City Council members consider a measure that would publicly track the number of migrants evicted from city shelters every day. And a new poll shows Donald Trump's support among Latino voters is growing. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Angel Ito. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night. That was great.
Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages.